This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Right, to now our next speaker is Ed King, who's a junior research fellow at St Catharines in Cambridge. Um, his first book, Science Fiction and Digital Technologies in Argentine and Brazilian Culture, was published last year. And he's going to talk to us about another of his interests, which is comic books and graphic art. Yeah. I realise uh, lunch is approaching and people are probably quite hungry, so I'm going to keep this short and um, there are going to be lots of pictures. So. Um, so my aim in this paper is to give shape, really, to a number of topics and critical frameworks for the study of graphic fiction and comics in Latin America. I'm going to echo Joanna earlier this morning and um, structure this as a syllabus for a kind of imaginary um, course on graphic fiction in the region. Um, the idea is to look at some possible critical frameworks and also introduce some text that, so that most of you probably won't be familiar with. Um, and so I just wanted to say that this paper isn't emerging from some kind of systematic attempt to study graphic fiction and comics in Latin America. It's, and I'm really taking it as an opportunity to group together some ideas that I've been looking at whilst teaching and writing about graphic fiction and comics over the past couple of years. So it's kind of um, the first step of a future research project and this kind of imaginary syllabus that at some point in the future might exist. And there are reasons why it's um, a fantasy at the moment. I'll come along to those um, right at the end. Um, also, most of my examples come from Brazil. Um, mainly because that's what I'm working on at the moment, contemporary <coughs> Brazilian culture, but also because I had a sneaking suspicion that Brazil might be a bit neglected today, so I thought it would be good to. Um, so, um, I've come up with four broad topics that would be imaginary sort of stages of this course. The first two are theoretically oriented, um, word and image and space and time, and the second two focus on more concrete themes for using the kind of theoretical ideas developed in the first two themes. Um, so that's comic, uh, city comics and comic book culture in the network society. Okay. So the first two topics are really a way of sidestepping the issue of how, how to define comics and graphic fiction by focusing instead on the main tensions that characterize these texts. So the first examines the manifestations and sort of theoretical implications of the interplay between text and image and graphic narratives in Latin America. So to do this, I draw on a number of studies of word-image combinations in texts such as photo books um, or literary works that invoke uh, imagery or photography or paintings through a, a number of different techniques. I found the work of the art critic and photography critic W.J.T. Mitchell particularly useful for placing comics in this context, despite the fact that he's only talked about comics himself very, very briefly. So in his book, Picture Theory, uh, Mitchell claims that, the defi that defining a text as mixed media, as many do in relation to comics and graphic fiction, is slightly meaningless, since all media, this is his quote, all media are mixed media and all representations are heterogeneous. There are no purely visual or verbal arts. So what he's getting at is that literary texts conjure images through a number of devices, such as ekphrasis and iconicity, iconicity being when the text itself uh, takes the form of an image, um, used in concrete poetry quite a lot, that, um, that was mentioned just now. Um, while images cannot help but evoke textual frames, even if it's to frustrate them. But most usefully, Mitchell argues that tensions between text and image always encode wider questions of power. So anxieties surrounding textual representations or verbal representations, he argues, encode anxieties in relation the representation of otherness more generally. So the desire to police boundaries between text and image goes hand in hand with the desire to reinforce the boundaries between self and other. So with this in mind, the question that I wanted to emerge in this first topic is to what is at stake in the tensions between word and image and that's evident in these texts. So a number of commentators on comics in Latin America specifically have argued that this question is particularly pertinent to graphic fiction in the region. And the editors of um, the collection Redrawing the Nation, I've got a bibliography at the end with all the details, um, have argued that with its emphasis on the interplay between text and image, comics culture developed in opposition to literary culture, and this is a, a sort of key quote from their introduction to that, to that collection. Contrary to the learned tradition of the book, which validated an opposition between writing and image in the continent's history, 
the narrative uh, practice of comics depends on a bridging between written and visual texts. So this first section places comics within a wide spectrum of texts that foreground tensions between text and image as a way of foregrounding and problematizing the power dynamics between literary culture and its various <coughs> visual others. So the main, so the two texts I was going to use um, to introduce these ideas, and I realize these aren't 21st century fictions. Um, they come from, they're a bit earlier, but anyway. Um, so, Turista Prengis by um, Mario Di Andraji um, is the first. And this, I would look at how it parodies the hierarchy of scientific text over photographic image in ethnographic photographic photography practice by using sort of lyrical um, captions um, coupled with, with photography that use very explicitly uh, ethnographic techniques. And um, here, this, the picture used in this um, recent edition uh, sort of evokes that through the, the, the photographer's uh, shadow encroaching onto the frame of the photograph itself. And the second would be um, Fantomas contra uh, los vampiros multinacionales by Cortaza. Um, published first in 75, but the edition I got hold of is slightly later. And what's interesting about this is how it stages the failure of literature to represent the transnational complexities of power as an intrusion of the comic text as exemplary of a kind of visually driven global mass culture into the literary text in a very kind of concrete way. He inserts comic, uh, comic book strips into the, into the text itself. And here's a detail, I'm not sure if it's clear. Um, of Octavio Paz reacting with horror to the fact that his books have disappeared from all the libraries in Mexico. And they're like, la gente llora en la calle. Um, uh, so the next section is space and time. And this examines the visual and textual strategies within the graphic narratives themselves, whilst thinking about some of the theoretical implications of these strategies. So a number of the most useful critical attempts to define the specificities of the comics medium have focused on the construction of space and time. Uh, the US academic Scott Bukatman, for instance, um, makes a connection between the way space and time are constructed in the modern comic medium and the industrialization of mass culture during the 19th century. Um, and this is a, a sort of key, key quote from, from one of his recent books. Time in comics is represented as territory and space and the experience of the flow of time can be carefully regulated. So Bukatman argues that the comics medium changes fundamentally in the wake of 19th century movement studies um, by the likes of Edward Muybridge. I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that, but that's um, one of his studies there, um, who, who used photography to come to a kind of rational understanding of the movement of the body. And these attempts, uh, Bukatman argues, to visualize movement by breaking it down into its constituent parts were closely bound up with the tailorist methods of industrial production that emerged around the same time. Processes that also uh, focused and relied on a kind of reg regulation of movement, breaking movement down into its constituent parts. So comics, and this is Bukatman's argument, have an ambiguous relationship with these methods of visualizing and regulating movement. They both reproduce them by also breaking movement down into its constituent parts. And you can see the parallel between, between this study and the, the kind of classic comics grid. Um, and also disrupting them through, through a number of techniques. So the focus of this section is how graphic narratives in Latin America exploit the specificities of the medium to both reproduce and disrupt the spatial temporalities of modernity. So one of the ideas I would want to explore is how the conventions through which time is spatialized in mainstream comics, conventions, remember, that emerge in relation to the instrumental logic of industrialization, makes it a useful platform for staging and disrupting how time is spatialized in colonial discourse and the version of colonial, colonial discourse employed in kind of foundational narratives um, in Latin America. And the two texts I was going to focus on, the first one is um, which was first, which was published in 2008 um, to mark the centenary of Japanese immigration to Brazil. And the book is divided into two sections. Um, the first one, which reads from left to right, the other one, which reads from right to left, like a, like a manga comic. And they both have narratives that fuse in the center. So one tells the story of uh, the son of a freed slave who wants to escape his, his life of poverty on the Fazenda and, and go to Sao Paulo to make his fortune. And the other one is told from, uh, told, uh, recounts the narrative of one of the first J 
Japanese immigrants to Brazil who also wants to escape the fazenda life um, to go to Sao Paulo to kind of make his fortune. They're both fused in the middle with their kind of joint escape. But, um, but a number of techniques, sort of the, the form of the text seems to evoke this idea of fusing the, the movement of of immigration into this new narrative of the nation, a kind of static narrative of the nation. But it's interesting how a number of the techniques used in the, in the comic book sort of frustrate this pro process of fusion. Instead, it stages the kind of disjunctive temp temporalities of migration that go against this idea of, of, of the temporality of the nation that, that, that it's trying to fold Japanese immigration into. And this clashes, interestingly, with the main discourses surrounding the centenary uh, celebrations which attempted to bind the movement of Japanese immigration into this, into this new narrative of nationhood. Um, the other text I don't have time to speak about, I don't think I also didn't have images, but it returns to talk, stories of, um, of the Sertao um, in Brazil and it returns to sort of foundational national narratives um, in a very interesting way that, that uses techniques of, of the coin book. Um, but the next section I'm going to look at uh, are entitled City Comics. And it builds on the previous two to examine how comic and graphic narratives have become a key medium for intervening into representations of urban experience in Latin America. Uh, the critic Andre Sur argues that in his quote um, from him, the city has deeply influenced comic stories, aesthetics, and structural appearance, such that comics' visual rhetoric both emulates and informs the city's characteristic mode of, of, of perception. So, Bukatman's argument about the modern comics' roots in the rationalization of space and time in industrial modernity provides a useful starting point for looking at how the grid structure of the comic echoes the grid structure of the modern city. So, what, so this, the third section examines how a number of the comics and graphic fictions uh, use the specificities of the medium to stage the multiple disjunctive temporalities of the Latin American city that, that both resist the grid of the comic book and resist the grid of the, of the city. And so the two texts I was going to focus on in this section are Mojo de Favela and Operación Bolívar. Um, so, Mojo de Favela is a, is a collaborative project between the photographer Mauricio Ora and cartoonist and scriptwriter Andre Ginis. The, the book is essentially a biography of the photographer and recounts his troubled childhood um, in Mojo de Providencia, one of the favelas um, built up in the hills around Rio de Janeiro. So it also recounts the, the early stages of his career as an internationally renowned photographer. And the book very clearly sets out to counteract some sort of stereotypes of favela life circulated by the mass media and show it to be something other than just a kind of seedbed of, of criminality. But ultimately, uh, what Ora, the photographer, and Genius, the comic book artist and scriptwriter, want to do is intervene into and change the conventions through which um, these marginalized areas of the city are represented. Um, more specifically, the book contests the modernization rhetoric surrounding government plans to rationalize the favela in, in preparation for the Olympics by widening roads and in the process tearing down housing. And the book was published um, to coincide with the, the debate surrounding, surrounding it. So it was a very clearly an intervention to this debate. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting to see how it does this through its through the form of the, the text itself. Uh, so the page structure, very clearly, you can see it slightly here, echoes the urban lay layout of Mojo de Providencia, and in the process kind of fr frustrates and neats an easy um, linear reading of the comic. And also the use of visual, of a visual style that, that echoes um, a woodblock printing style that is more closely associated, associated with Literatura de Cordel of the Northeast, a kind of popular form of, of literature from the Northeast. It also inscribes into the imagery itself this kind of layering of temporalities, because it's not woodblock wood printing itself, it's a kind of digital version of, of woodblock printing. Um, and the other text I don't have time to talk about here is Operación Bolívar by Edgar Clement, which is first published in uh, independent comic book called Gaito Comics um, uh, during the 90s and was only published in sort of book form in 2010. And, and I, just from these two images, you can see how it uses these techniques of collage to, to uh, 
present the kind of palimpsestic city of, of uh, Mexico City. And here is the culminating moment in the book that retells the story of the massacre um, uh, of Tlatelolco in 68 um, and, and using these collage techniques and in a way that as well that draws on and intervenes into debates surrounding the massacre at the time. Um, okay, the final section examines comic book culture in the context of a network society. And a number of critics have identified connections between the comic form and the information structures of the digital age. So um, Jared Gardner, is a, who I'm quoting from here, argues that, it, it's, he, he basically argues that it's no coincidence, this is the first bit of the quote, um, that the contemporary graphic novel came of age in the late 1980s and 1990s in America at precisely the same time as the rise of the personal computer. I'm sure um, Francophone critics would dispute the chronology he sets out here, but his idea is kind of quite useful nonetheless. Um, and the way in which comic form, this is part of his argument, the way in which comic form combines text and image and pre pre presents information in a kind of modular structure that can be rearranged is exemplary of, and this is the second bit of the quote, um, the sea change in the ways in which our culture represents itself to itself, moving from the traditional linear cause and effect narrative, and he uses an example of the realist novel, and toward the database, multi-layered, non-hierarchical, navigable archives. So his argument is that although the conventions of the modern comic were forged within print culture, its non-linear form echoes the non-hierarchical hierarchical database logic that dominates in cultures mediated by network technology. And as such, it becomes a useful platform for thinking about and critiquing those, those practices. So one of the most interesting um, thing, it struck me that Gardner's comments are particularly apt in relation to Brazil, in which the rise of interest in web comics has, has sort of impelled and driven this, this um, renewed interest by, by um, <coughs> publishers and critics alike in book forms. And there's been a huge surge in the publication of book-length graphic narratives in Brazil that's, that's combined with this surge of interest on, on the internet, and they both come hand in hand. So what I wanted to do with this final section is look at the conflictive relationships between print culture and digital culture that, that, that are evident in these texts. I was going to choose, choose two of them. Um, the first is Mundo Pecci by Lorenzo Mutarelli, and the other is a comic book series, also published in Brazil, called Turma da Monica Jovem, um, by Mauricio de Souza Productions. So, Mundo Pecci is a collection of comic strips by the Brazilian novelist um, and comic book artist, Lorenzo Mutarelli. Um, and they were first published on this website called uh, Cyber Comics between 1998 and 2000. The, the website doesn't exist anymore. And they were only collected subsequently in book form um, in 2004, published by Devere. So the strips circle around this thematic obsession with how the division between individual and collective memory is becoming more and more blurred in a world of increasing technological mediations. And this strip on, that I've taken the section of, on the left here, um, entitled Door Ancestral, and Ancestral Pain, focus on the connection between technology and memory through a focus on family photographs. And the strip consists of a series of family photographs that the comic book artist has copied with ink drawings and then painted over with watercolors. And the images are then framed with these oddly formal texts that, that speak of Mutarelli's mother's enduring discomfort and uh, disappointment of family life. So the strip kind of evokes the social media practice of sharing memories online by posting family photographs, but also disrupts that by depersonalizing these memories. So by painting over the details and insisting on the tension between the concreteness of the photographs and the uncertainty of the memories, and that, that uncertainty is, is drawn attention to by the, by the, the frames themselves, um, also in a sense denies ownership of the images and the memories attached to them. And in the process, he draws attention to the increasingly porous nature of individual memory in a network society. Um, so, Turma de Monica Joven was a series of comics produced in a manga style and launched by Mauricio de Souza Productions in 2008 um, in an attempt to claw back a readership that was disappearing online. So, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about this is that so in the 60s, Mauricio de Souza published his line of comics 
in a very direct attempt to, to um, wrest some of the market control off from, from Disney. And now he's doing the same thing with the rise of manga comics, which are taking up a huge share. So he, he's both producing these comics in a manga style and attempting to emulate the, the tendency for manga to, um, to use kind of transmedia narrative strategies, so to, to distribute narratives over on and offline media platforms. And it did this incredibly successfully, and, uh, um, and it became one of the best-selling comic books um, of all time in, in Latin America. Um, but what I found particularly interesting uh, in the series is are the cracks that start to emerge in the comics attempt to reconcile print and digital cultures. And it's very explicitly trying to do this. It's, it's still um, uh, part of print culture, but it's trying to appeal to, to digital culture in a number of ways. Um, and what I would want to draw out in this final section of, of this imaginary course was that the comic book series constant appeal to the reader as a kind of co-producer and co-writer of the comic. And its attempt to create this continuity between virtual and real um, space, as well as this strange tendency to um, orientalize vir virtual space and, in a sense, to displace technological otherness onto a kind of cultural otherness. And all of these speak of this, this anxiety about the changing nature of space and time in a network society that's disrupting notions of space and time. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, that's the bibliography of things I refer to today. And I just want to briefly mention um, that this is a kind of fancy idea for, for, a, uh, for a new course, because there are, there are a number of very concrete kind of practical um, problems with, with teaching graphic fiction. I've been teaching a master's course over the past few years with using my own kind of personal archive of books and sort of sharing them with a small group of students which they can then go on out to borrow. But that obviously isn't a, a good long-term solution. And to be able to teach this course, students will need to have access to these books. And they're very expensive, they're very difficult to get hold of. And um, sort of sharing PDFs works sometimes and only partially but it's the kind of material out, materiality of the book that's often very important. So I think in order to be able to teach a course like this, um, we would have to work very closely with, with libraries to, to make these texts accessible. And, to, um, and that's kind of what I want to open it up for. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you.